Hi, how's everyone doing today? I apologize, I'm a little sick, so I hit a bottle of water behind that chair. Hope no, no one notices it. All right, so I'm here today to talk about the hashtag fake news movement that's sweeping the United States right now. Um, first, before I define it, I just kind of want to see how good are you guys at figuring out if something is fake or real? What do you think? Science guy Bill Nye killed in massive vinegar baking soda explosion. Real or fake? Fake? Yeah, clearly this is, this is fake news. This was produced by um, a publication called The Onion, which declares that they are fake news. But just think about this for a second. Remember those volcanoes you used to make when you were little? You pour the vinegar and the baking soda in and it just kind of fizzled out. How big of a volcano would you need to actually kill somebody? Right? It's, it's kind of crazy to think about, right? So this is clearly false. But then again, the internet. So here are people's actual responses to this article on Twitter. I like the first one. Okay, so guys, hashtag Bill Nye the Science Guy died in a vinegar and baking soda explosion on Monday, and I just now heard about it. This, this is a, like a real Twitter post. So this is kind of what we're working with when we're trying to tackle this whole concept of fake news. Um, so before we start, I just kind of want to define uh, fake news and just talk about what is and maybe what is not fake news. So is fake news something that is intentionally fake? Um, is it something that is intentionally misleading? Is it something that has a clear bias? Or is it just something that you disagree with? Um, is it The Onion? Is it The Daily Show? With you know, Trevor Noah, Jon Stewart. Uh, how about Fox News? CNN? So it's become, it's become kind of confusing in today's day and age, especially when you're on social media and the internet, about what is or what is not considered fake news. Um, so the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define it as uh, news that is intentionally fake or misleading and designed to provoke an emotional response. So intention, intentionality is what's kind of important here uh, because a lot of the arguments when you talk about what's posted on CNN or New York Times or whatever and, and labeled fake news, um, a lot of times it's just it's bad journalism. Um, it's kind of came up yesterday. I showed Rhea, one of our organizers, an article about um, a, an astronaut whose DNA changed and it was posted on CNN and a bunch of other sources. Turns out, bad reporting. It wasn't actually true. Um, so we're all susceptible to this. So the, the question is then, how do we know what is actually true? Uh, because there's, again, there's so much information out there, it's really hard and it's quite impossible to know absolutely everything about everything. Uh, so I'm going to make the argument that we rely on experts. So experts, it can be anything from a scientist, um, a teacher, uh, you know, a, a doctor, or possibly even a TEDx speaker. Um, but I, I don't claim I'm an expert in, in this regard completely. So when it comes down to it, when we're looking at fake news, um, we have to differentiate between what is fake, what is real, but also what is an opinion, because this causes a lot of confusion. Um, opinions are actually quite useful. They're, they're fun and they're good to get in arguments with. Uh, for instance, who's gonna win the Champions League this year? Anyone? Anyone up there? Cl clear, yeah, clearly Liverpool is gonna win, right? It is, it's not even close. So this type of thing, you can go to your friend's house and get a really good debate about it. You know, it's fun. Um, other things we can get into an argument about have to do with, say, economics, right? There's multiple schools of economics. Not a single one of those schools will accurately predict the future 100% of the time. So you need to understand that these types of things are, are opinions and, you know, they're good. But there are other things that you cannot have opinions about. Um, a lot of these are science-based. For instance, you know, are humans causing climate change? Um, are vaccines beneficial for children? There's scientific evidence that support these claims. So just because you disagree with something doesn't necessarily mean you can outright discount it. Uh, so the question is then, why do people continue to believe false information even when presented in facts? Now, this is a huge topic and I'm not gonna talk about all the reasons, but specifically right now in the United States in relation to the hashtag fake news movement, I'm gonna make the argument it's the rise of authoritarianism. Now, I know what he's thinking, you know, you guys are thinking he's probably going to make some kind of like Trump and Hitler comparison. And I'm saying that's 
kind of a ridiculous comparison. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, what I'm talking about is just a small group of people uh, who believe that or are more comfortable with an authority figure governing over them than you know, the, maybe the will of the, the general population. And this is, again, a minority of the population in the U.S., but they, they've become very vocal um, in recent years. So I'm going to further define authoritarianism based on an article from the Washington Post in 2017. So uh, it talks about how much people prefer conformity to authorities and norms within the groups which they identify. Um, then it goes on to say, people with a stronger pre disposition towards authoritarianism are less likely to tolerate those who violate the norms or challenge authority they believe are important. And this connects directly to the fake news movement because a lot of what is labeled hashtag fake news, even when it has truth to it, directly goes against the norms of the larger group. And it just so happens in this case that most of these uh, people who value authoritarianism um, or the power of an authority or happen to be Republican. Um, so, sorry, it also goes on to say, the apparent impact of authoritarian is stronger when people feel that social order is threatened or undergoing rapid change. And if you look at the rise of the authoritarian movement in the US, there's a direct correlation uh, from two events. The first one is 9-11. It, it completely changed US foreign policy and the way certain people looked at the world, and also the financial crisis, 2008-2009, uh, when a lot of people in the US lost their jobs, and um, those types of jobs you know, are not coming back. So a lot of those people are the ones who gravitate towards this type of movement. There are two studies done, uh, psychology studies that I want to do, or that I want to talk about, uh, that are related to this. Um, the first one is by two guys, Brendan Nehan and Jason Riefler. And what they said, uh, what they looked at anyway, were Bush supporters, you know, George W. Bush. And what they tested was something called the backfire effect, where they presented a, a piece of false information uh, to these people, and they presented some true information. And what they found on the whole was uh, many of these people would actually then hold on to the false information even more, completely rejecting the truth. Now, you might find this a little bit disturbing, and the fact that how can someone just ignore something that was true and hold on to beliefs? And this is actually quite common, especially looking at psychology and confirmation bias. Um, the second study I want to talk about, if you recognize the names, again, we have Nihan and Riefler with, uh, I guess, their friends Porter and Wood, where they tried to um, falsify or confirm the, the backfire effect with Trump supporters in, tw in the 2016 election. So what they found was actually quite different results. Uh, when they tested for the backfire effect and they presented these people with the true information, the Trump supporters actually acknowledged that the information was false and that a lie was told. But they didn't care. It didn't change their perception of, of the candidate. Which, again, this flat-out rejection of the truth is kind of what's a little bit concerning. Because without the truth, we don't really know what else is going on, especially when we talk about things like journalism. Um, I know it seems like I'm kind of being a little bit biased right here against conservatives. So the question is, do only conservatives fall for fake news? And of course not. Um, a recent study in Oxford University looked at like 48,000 Facebook pages and a bunch of Twitter feeds. And they found on the whole, conservatives do share more fake news, but liberals are just as guilty as sharing anything they can find, especially if it's anti-Trump or connecting the Trump-Russia conspiracy. So this is something that, no matter conservative, liberal, we're all doing this. And you know, again, it's, it's quite concerning. So where does most of this happen? Uh, you know, the internet, Facebook, social media. Um, now, I'm American. You know, American loves their freedom, whether it's their freedom fries, their freedom toast, or especially their freedom of speech. And there's no better place that they present this, the internet. Again, Facebook, Twitter, you ever try to read a comment section on like CNN or Fox News? You get, everyone has their opinion out there. And again, a lot of people don't necessarily have a grounding in truth. And the internet has given us this amazing tool for anyone to say whatever they have on, the, uh, on their mind and gain an audience and a following. And it's actually pretty easy to create something that is, is fake. Um, for instance, 
Is this real or fake? What do you think? Fake? Uh, yes, my daughter and my cat are not in fact giants and they did not invade Dubai recently, right? This is an actual photo of my daughter and my cat in our kitchen, actual photo of Dubai. You know, quick Photoshop, put them together, and we have a interesting monster movie, I guess, I don't know what to call it. Um, but this is the same technology that gives the flat earth movement credence, right? They argue that the whole thing's been photoshopped and conspiracy between the Russians and the Americans. So, you know, the, um, creating fake news, again, quite easy. So what about this one? Real or fake? So 40 foot waves hitting outer banks. Any thoughts? Real? Yeah. Well, you look at the size of the wave, you look at the break here, that pier is not in pretty good shape, but yet yeah, if, if you're going to figure out if it's fake or true, two things you can do. You can kind of look at who took it, and about seven or so of my friends, all college educated or university educated, posted this on Facebook as kind of like, wow, look at this. But if you, again, you just kind of click the link for the photographer, everything on his site is clearly photoshopped, right? Or you can do the other method of just Googling photo of 40-foot wave in North Carolina. First thing that comes up is a local newspaper that completely debunks the picture. But people don't take this extra step and become a skeptic before they post information online. And um, why this is important is the more false and fake news out there, the more we lose contact with what is actually true and what is actually real. You know, if your grandmother shares an article every now and again that's, that's fake, that's not really going to harm anything. But if it becomes a social norm just to post whatever without any qualifier that, hey, this might not be true or anyone see anything about this, it's going to completely take away from all concept of reality. Um, where this starts to get, again, concerning is when you look at, as a history teacher, uh, the way different authoritarian leaders have come to power. And what they've all done is that they've completely created their own sense of truth. Uh, famously, Mussolini did this, and he was so good at creating his own reality that he started to believe it, so much so that he didn't even see his own downfall. Someone who's done this a little bit better is um, a guy by the name of Vladimir Putin. Heard of him? So, I don't know how many of you know this or not, but Russia actually had a free press in the 1990s, you know, more or less. And this press um, helped Yeltsin get elected with, um, and defeat the communists, along with the Russian oligarchs. And when Yeltsin's term was up in 1999, they, um, the press and the oligarchs got together to kind of preserve their lifestyle. And they tried to elect this unheard of former FSB, or like the modern KGB agent, again, Vladimir Putin. No one had heard of him. Um, but the press pushed all these pro-Putin stories, they pushed all these anti-opponent stories, and Putin ended up winning pretty easily. Now, Putin, unlike Yeltsin, didn't really tolerate any opposition from the press. So between his election and 2011, he worked slowly to nationalize all the media. And when you nationalize the media, you can use it to create stories that benefit you. And when Putin was again elected in 2018, or sorry, uh, 2011, uh, Russia wasn't doing so well. And because of the uh, way he w came to power again, there were mass protests on the street. And um, he used his power of the media to create kind of this false, uh, almost like war of words, trade war with the United States. And while it was able to stop the, the protests, it didn't really do much for his own personal support. Uh, and this changed again in 2014 when you have the Ukrainian revolution and uh, Russia takes Crimea. And this shot Putin's approval rating through the roof. He created this false enemy through his news of these uh, Ukrainian fascists that were backed by the US and Europe. Again, this is not true, uh, but the people of Russia, they, they loved it and his approval rating shut up to about 90%. And I, I was actually in Russia a couple months after the, uh, 
invasion of Ukraine and everyone you talked to was talking about how Putin is restoring Russia's greatness and you know, they loved it. Um, but a, a survey actually showed that many Russians knew this whole thing was fabricated and this, the whole enemy and news organizations were actually hiring actors and filming these heroic scenes. And what they found out was um, people in Russia didn't care that it wasn't true. And this is quite similar, again, going back to what's going on with Trump. Um, PolitiFact found that, set, or it's like a fact check website, found that 70% of Trump, his uh, speeches and his claims during his primary elections were false. It's 70%. Uh, and only 15% were either true or mostly true. In comparison, Hillary was like maybe around 50% true and mostly true. I mean, she's not great either, but, but the fact that 70% were false and people didn't care. And that's, again, why this is so concerning, is people's disconnect from the truth. Um, so when it comes down to it, is a fake news actual, or sorry, is a mainstream media actually fake news? And of course the answer is no. Um, when, the, kind of like the article I was talking about before about the DNA, a lot of bad reporting happens, you know, people do retractions, and we have to remember that. Just because we agree with something, again, doesn't mean it's fake news. The media actually has done a lot since this whole fake news thing to kind of correct itself and improve its standards. Uh, somewhat recently, the Washington Post actually uncovered a plot by a conservative group to expose the Washington Post as a source of fake news. And it did that by actual diligent journalism. So when it comes down to it, is there hope for us? You know, are we just going to descend into this labyrinth of, of fake news and never going to know it's true again? Um, so, kind of yes and no. So there's a, a new type of a psychology uh, field called genopolitics. And what it says is liberal conservatives, um, they, you're actually genetically predisposed on, on the whole to be liberal or conservative. Now, if this is true, we're not going to change anyone's mind, right? We're not going to convince someone of something that is true or false. But what we can do is eliminate fake news by being skeptical. So the first thing you guys need to do is go home, before you post something, check it out. You know, give it a quick Google search or you know, run it by a couple of friends before you actually share it. Um, next thing you can do is just read information from the uh, other side of the political landscape, things that you don't necessarily agree with. So you kind of get a better understanding of what everyone's thinking. And finally, in schools, we need to do a better job of teaching and learning digital and media literacy. What this means is um, how do you detect bias? How do you know what is true, not true? Um, what's an opinion versus what is fact? And you learn this through your social science courses, your, your history, sociology, psychology. So we need to emphasize those when it comes to education. So together, if we stop posting fake news and we learn more about digital media literacy, we can defeat fake news and win the war on truth. Thank you and good luck.